evening. Tonight, our theme is breaking the rules. Not that um, my jacket, in case you're worried, is breaking any. It is, I promise, 100% pure, genuine, fake. A leopard, of course, does not change its spots, and one of my guests tonight is someone who's consistently found himself out in the political wilderness, living by his own rules. That's Enoch Powell. Also on the guest list is Terry Jones, who for more than 20 years has been blazing a provocative trail through the jungle of British comedy, Python in Tow. I'll also be inviting Neil Sadaka to sing for us and show how a classical pianist turned into a man who's written more than a thousand pop songs. But first, a doctor's daughter from Weybridge who ended up in Hollywood. She starred in such films as Day for Night, Bullet and Rich and Famous. She's also managed to appear in a lot of rather racy films and still retain her dignity. She doesn't have a string of broken marriages behind her. She doesn't have a house full of servants. She doesn't go to all the right parties, but she is most definitely a star. And she's flown in from Hollywood specially to be with us tonight. Please, will you welcome Jacqueline Bissett. <laughs> You are what is known in Hollywood, I think, as a class act. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think sometimes. That, that, that is the act. But it hasn't stopped them, has it, or has it, asking you to take your clothes off in movies? Well, I don't think there's any no um, particular link between class and clothes off. I mean, Isn't there? not that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, don't classy ladies asked, keep they their clothes on? They can always ask. Do, do what? Don't classy ladies keep their clothes on? Well, I think they. Do they? <laughs> How do they manage? In um, public, I <laughs> should say. In public. Well, I've sort of always negotiated and, um, you know, but as I've been constantly tricked every time I showed more than my left or right shoulder, it was, you know, the thing about filming is they always say, well, we can't see what you're going to take off, but please take it off. We promise you we can't see it in the frame, you know. Mm. There's the television frame and there's the movie screen size frame and they look for the camera. But we, we might see it, so please just lower it, would you? Just lower it, or take off your pants, would you? But, you know, we can't see your bottom, we can't see it, and we promise you, only see your shoulders and your head. Would you please take them off? You say, wait a minute, could, I, could someone lie there and let me see what you're seeing? And funnily enough, the extraordinary thing about cameras is occasionally you can see at a certain angle, you can't really see, but you can sort of, it could get caught in the frame, let's say. So, very <laughs> last, <laughs> yes, and um, so it's, it's, it's a question of manoeuvre. But you've learned not to trust them, I absolutely don't trust. I mean, you, to get my shoulder strap down is a major talking. I mean, I always see the producers always arrive. There's always a scene that you've said basically before you start, I'm not going to do a nude scene. So, mm. let's just, if you want me to do the film, I'm delighted to do the film. I don't want to do a nude scene, it's not necessary. Da, da, da. And then one day you'll be in your caravan having coffee, waiting for a sort of next scene, and you suddenly see uh, two or three men with their heads lowered, heading towards the caravan. Say, They've oh, come ha, to negotiate. Come to negotiate. And they always think that if it's the first time it's ever happened to one, mm. they that you won't recognize it, and I see it coming a mile off. Mm. So I said, come in, gentlemen, have a cup of coffee. But, but a lot of women in the end do succumb. I mean, I wonder if it's for their own reasons, not because they've been negotiated into it or paid enough. Uh, well, there Joan are times. Joan Collins, for example, was uh, a centre field of Playboy when she was 50, wasn't she? I think she wanted to do it. I mean, I think she, she was did. wonderful. She wanted to. Um, I think it's, if you do it and it's relevant to the scene, that's part of life. And it's not, I'm not saying that it's, I'm not against it. I'm not, I just not particularly comfortable. Mm. I never have been. So you will never succumb? Well, I've done little bits and pieces, you know. The funny thing is, I've seen little bits, little and, bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing, most insulting, I thought, I did a movie called High Season in Greece about three years ago, and the director, who was a lady, a wonderful lady called Claire Peplow, talked me into it. It was a night moonlight scene, and I had to run with Ken Branner. In fact, I believe he was on the show recently. That's right, last week. Um, he, into the water for this mad drunk scene. And um, I finally agreed that if there was nobody in the front, we had to clear the rocks and the bushes it was done at midnight in the moonlight you know so i said it's just going to be a little tushy running into the water my close one they cut the scene mm -hmm. they didn't want it <laughs> <laughs> we've got, we've got a, a scene which is a far cry from mm. all of this yes. um it's a very very early scene i don't know if you recall it that where you starred in bed you didn't have much to say in fact you didn't say anything what was this days here a very important day too wedding day and this morning, like any other, begins with a proper breakfast. An egg. Packed with protein.
For if you're going to look and feel beautiful, you must eat properly every day of your pretty life. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. And the funny thing about that day, I remember, was you had to, I had to pick up the egg with one hand and take the knife and slice the top off with only one hand. And the egg had to be the right consistency. Well, it's, it's virtually humanly impossible to get the egg the right consistency and do it with one hand with a knife off the top. And we maybe 15 eggs later. It's a, we, it's we, a we problem the it. nation has never solved, how to undo its egg. But anyway, um, let me ask you just briefly um, about your personal life, mm -hmm. if I may. Marcello Mastroianni uh, said, I found a wonderful quote as I was reading about you, he said that he had the impression you were this beautiful woman who lived at the other end of the beach, who was constantly on the verge of an affair or just coming out of one but never quite in one is that, that wasn't how that, you... no that wasn't quite the quote i think it was it was i remember reading that and thinking um it was that it was never the i was always yes going into one or coming out of one but never never in the middle meaning what i don't know i think it meant that i was living life in perpetual um passion i think it meant do you have you well, not perpetual. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I do follow my heart, let's say. And, and your heart um, has, has led you into to three very substantial relationships, mm. I think, each of which have lasted some seven years apiece, mm. but have never quite fulfilled themselves, have never quite Actually, fulfilled Actually, they were their extremely promise. fulfilling, extremely fulfilling. It didn't necessarily go in the conventional ending, you know. Um, I read lots of fairy tales when I was a little girl, and they lived happily ever after. And I, my father used to say, you know, that's not the way it happens, really. That's about the only advice I ever got. It was never a direct thing, but he said, it's not quite like that in life. Things don't always go quite. And I didn't really have any expectations, particularly. I feel that I've been incredibly lucky. I've um, had some very very fulfilling relationships and generally speaking i feel very um good about them and and uh that's really i suppose my i don't have any complaints about them not going in a conventional way let's say but your mother does and she'd still like to have you married oh i think she would yes yes <laughs> i think she would yes i think she mothers would. are all the same yes. jacqueline visit for the moment thank you very okay. much indeed thank, thank you, you. ago next week a flying circus arrived on our television screens and the rules of comedy were consigned to the dustbin one of the monty python team is with me tonight he's the silly welsh one who used to wear a wide variety of costume he later stepped into hot water when he made life of brian and then there came personal services for which according to the tabloids he did some extensive research his latest film is a viking saga starring the hapless eric who can't rape and only just manages to pillage here, he finds a novel approach to the art of slaying the dragon. Should the sun do that? Look out! Ah! Ah! What is it? It's the dragon of the North Sea! Ah! Gentlemen, Terry Jones. <laughs> so this is this is Terry, a new way of slaying the dragon. You merely make him sneeze, huh? Yes, yeah, actually, it's an old way. Really, I think uh, I was alarmed to see in Baron Munchausen, Terry Gilliam's latest film, that exactly the same. They escape from a sea monster by making it sneeze. 
And then I was watching uh, Pinocchio the other the other day, and of course the snake comes out of that as well. So yes, I thought so. I'd invented it. <laughs> <laughs> we never quite saw a whole dragon there. Do you see sort of bits of face? And bits yeah, of well, eye? this was deliberate, really. I mean, when we were trying to raise the money, we tr made the film on quite a small budget for this kind of movie. It was uh, fifteen million dollars, and. Uh, when we were trying to raise the money, everybody was saying, oh, they read the script and saying, oh, wait a minute, this is a $30 million movie, you can't make it for 15. So we had to sort of try and reassure people, and one of the things was, I said, look, this monster is so big, it can't fit onto the, onto the cinema screen. So in fact, we, uh, we actually, full size, we only made the nose and one eye. And the rest of the monster was quarter scale and smaller. So we're learning how much cameras lie this evening. <laughs> too. A jolly, scruffy looking lot of Vikings they were, though, too. How did you manage to direct them? It must have been an impossible task. I mean, no, we had a wonderful time, actually. It was really such a, really a lot of fun, actually. But I can imagine Mickey Rooney and John Cleese running around in animal skins <laughs> and false beards. I mean, it's impossible. Uh, Mickey Rooney was absolute joy to direct, um, mainly because we never saw him, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, he was, on, he was doing um, Sugar Babies in the theatre at the time, so we couldn't get him for rehearsals. And uh, he would only appear on set from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock on the set when you're filming, which isn't very long when you make a movie. Um, but he, had, he did send his man Kevin along, and Kevin is sort of the same size and shape as Mickey and wears a wig <laughs> and uh, learnt the lines and did the moves. So we'd rehearse everything with Kevin, and then 10 o'clock, on the dot, Mickey would turn up and... Uh, his man Kevin would take him onto one side and say, well, we'll do this and we'll move down that. And Mickey would go, OK, fine, let's do it. <laughs> and we'd shoot it. Great professionalism. <laughs> and you maintained your tradition and directed the whole thing in a frock. Uh, well, now, strictly speaking, <laughs> okay, this, it isn't a frock, actually. I know it looks like a frock, but it isn't. It's, a, it's meant to be a toga, I think. <laughs> but you normally do it in the nude, do you? Well, I have, yes. There was once in the life of Brian, actually. I was, uh, I was playing an old hermit down a hole, right? <laughs> Right in the middle of the desert, you understand, Jacqueline. I mean, you'd, uh, you understand. Well, they talked me into it. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, the cameras won't be on me, you know, apart from when they're shooting me. And uh, I was this hermit down the hole, and uh, all I was wearing was this long beard. And I must say, it was, uh, it was a very strange experience, actually, sort of getting up and sort of arriving at the set at sort of five o'clock in the morning and having this young, very nice makeup lady affixing this beard onto my private part so it wouldn't uh, <laughs> wiggle around. Well, I mean, it did wiggle around. <laughs> I was going to say, is that how you stop wiggling your mouth? <laughs> so is the thesis then, according to Jones, that sex and violence is permissible on the screen as long as you can laugh at it? I mean, is that the latest idea? I, mean, I, I prefer sex off the screen, personally, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think for, I'm not very keen on violence. I, I think all these things about what your attitude is towards them. And with violence, for instance, I think it's when you start glamorising violence and making violence into something that's, that people want to emulate. Or when you have something like that, a film like Lethal Weapon, in which the sort of denouement of the film is when the cop who hasn't been able to kill anybody, has never used his gun, finally is able to kill someone. And that's great. That's the, that's the great climax of the film. I find there's something obscene about that. But I don't think violence in itself, I, I wouldn't keep violence out of uh, the film. I mean, my, uh, my film, Eric the Viking, has got a 15 rating in uh, Sweden because of the violence. Uh, nothing to do but with sex. But it's very sex. laughable violence, just as, as, as John Cleese having a, an on-screen affair in Wanda is very <laughs> laughable. Don't tell John, who's saying that? Because <laughs> <laughs> he's made I mean, it he's at last. It, it is, I mean, sex these days is laughable on screen, isn't it, Jackie? Could you ever play a, a, a sex scene seriously again, really? Difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I quite know what you want to know, but I... I um... Well, I just they think it is so serious. Well, all right, scenes. let me They're explain what I mean. I, I feel that we have seen people perform in all mm. these various ways mm. according to so many people's imagination. Oh, we don't really need to see it anymore. And now it's a bit well, like a whole as, new as, generation who <laughs> hasn't seen it. Do you think so they do it any differently? It. I don't know. It's like a good meal, you know, next morning. You wanted to have it again. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel as if I'm coming around to the Barbara Cartland point of view, really, which is kind of leave it at the bedroom. Not, well, not because that, yeah. I think it should be left to the imagination, but because because I just know and I'm bored. You're bored, yeah. Are you not, are you not bored Well, I've always been a bit bored looking at it, yes. Because I think usually the story stops when they get it, start getting into the love scene, you know, and you wait, sort of mm. wait. Some yes. people go to the loo and some people... Well, that's right. Well, I, think, yeah. I think it's very boring watching the... or visible watching the erotic when there's also another 600 people in the room watching it with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's different if you're on your own, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is... No, I mean, I no. think... <laughs> at 
one of the great wisdoms of the evening, <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of sex in Python. Very difficult to believe it's 20 years old. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, they had a, the New York Museum of Broadcasting. They did a, a sort of respecter, a retrospective of Python, and we went along. You know, it's like suddenly you're in a museum, and it's like being dead all of a sudden, you know. But that broke all of us. You were, you were accused of blasphemy and immorality. Mm. You were considered deeply offensive by the BBC. Yes, very odd. I mean, actually, you know, the, the sketch that actually got the most protests was a sketch about the First World, set in sort of First World War, and they're uh, drawing lots going over the top, and they're doing, they end up doing one potato, two potato, three potato, four, you know. And that actually made, that got more protests than any other sketch, sketch we did. You could never tell what is going, what, who's going to protest about what. You can't. But I think what people, you know, got worried about was such a lot of kind of vomiting about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that came later. We grew up into that, you know. That, uh... <laughs> you, in fact, were the inventor of the Silly Walk originally, weren't you? No, not really. It was a, the Silly Walk sketch was something that uh, John Cleese and Graham Chapman had sort of uh, been toying with the idea of. And they, they rang Mike and I up one morning when we were writing something else, and they said, look, we've got this idea for sketch, but you can't take it anywhere. And then Mike and I sort of sat down and wrote the sketch. And then John sort of made it his own by doing, performing these amazing contortions with his legs. Uh, Somebody said, he, well, he, only he could do it, really. I mean, he had the legs. You have to be very tall and have very long legs to do it. And have know. to be very silly. <laughs> Can I ask very question? serious, actually. How, um, how much are they scripted? Uh, how much is it always improvisation? No, it's all, it's all totally scripted. Totally scripted. Yeah. You see, like, um, whenever we were filming, we had, well, uh, Holy Grail, we had five weeks to film it in. And uh, that's not very long to film yeah. a whole feature oh. film in. Um, Eric the Viking, we, uh, well, it's not Python, but we had ten weeks for that, so that was kind of luxury. But in order to do a film in those circumstances, you've got to really button down everything, know exactly where you are every second of the day, kind mm. of thing. You know, it's, oh, it's three o'clock, we can't do this anymore. It's an mm. extremely serious business, being silly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Jones. <laughs> his first professional appearance at the age of eight as a concert pianist. He went on to fulfill his parents' hopes and aspirations, though not exactly as they'd intended. By the time blue suede shoes were giving way to winkle pickers, he was selling almost as many records as Elvis Presley, and he's still going strong. With a medley of just a few of his greatest hits, here is Neil Sadaka. You treat me cruel You hurt me And you make me cry But if you leave me I will surely die Darling, there will never be another Cause I love you so Don't ever leave me Say you'll never go Breaking up 
is all so hard to do. I'm very glad you didn't become a concert pianist, Neil Sedaka. Well, I do do what I enjoy. Uh, but all of those you wrote with someone else, didn't you? Primarily, I have collaborated through the years. I've done some lyrics, but uh, in the last two years, I've concentrated on my own lyrics, and I'm very happy about it, like a kid in a candy store. Really? Will you play one for us now, one of your very own and your newest? A debut. I'd love it. What's it called? When a Love Affair is Through. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Sedaka. Green fields and blue days and bright shining smiles Midsummer madness that clings all the while Remember we were happy then Now I can't remember where or when We had our magic carpet ride But all that's left our tears inside Now it seems that all I have are shattered dreams no photographs and I suppose that's how it goes when a love affair Memories that still remain Gazing through my window pane I see your face What can I do When a love affair is through Footsteps in the snow Walking hand in hand Laughing in the snow In our short-lived wonderland Dark clouds of winter Just drift past my mind Cold, bleak and grey days all I can find I sit here softly in my room Trying to find the notes To form a tune A tune to bring you back again But I'm content remembering when It seems that all I have are shattered dreams, no photographs. And I suppose that's how it goes when a love affair is through. I sit by the phone now and think should I call? I dial your old number. There's no ring at all. 
I mustn't think of yesterday. Maybe I'm just better off that way. And if I look, someday I'll find the strength to give me peace of mind. Memories that still Yes, our love affair is through.